Well, I was born in Germany at a bad time in 1932, and um, my father was a communist, a doctor. My mother was an actress, but uh, and he was Jewish, but she was not. He was an activist and was very much against the Nazis at, in 1932 already, who had taken over much of Berlin. And he got himself into hot water with the Nazis, even though they were not yet in power. Because uh, he was a doctor, he gave testimony against a Nazi doctor who had done a bad operation. And they ganged up on him and they took him prisoner, the Nazis. My mother, who was pregnant with me, managed through her father to get him freed because there was still a federal government, a little bit of a federal government. And they together pushed him across the border to Czechoslovakia. And my mother then followed after I was born. Uh, we lived in Czechoslovakia as a family until about 1938. What happened then is that uh, Chamberlain gave the Sudetengebiet, which is the piece of Czechoslovakia that is around the outer part of Czechoslovakia and facing Germany, had a lot of Germans in it. He, uh, Ch Chamberlain, who gave the Sudetengebiet, that section of Czechoslovakia, to Hitler in the hope that Hitler would then stop being so aggressive. Well, that was a complete mistake, but that's what happened. And many Americ many people, especially Jews, communists, anybody, had to get the hell out of Czechoslovakia. We were very lucky. My father, being a doctor, had a profession, and he was allowed to come into the United States because a woman in St. Louis, whose name is Styx, S-T-I-X, gave bond to him so that if they should get into trouble in the United States, they would pay for the welfare. In immigration in the United States was no better then than it is now. And uh, we came to the United States with that very wonderful woman who didn't know us from anybody. And then uh, that was the beginning of the United States. I went to public school. And uh, then I got very interested in electronics as a kid. And that's where I began to worry about things like what later became part of my profession. So that's the early time. There was nobody who cared about that. There was, I mean, you know, they, uh, my children, for example, are not interested in technology. They're my one of my children is a musician, a musical. Well, she's a musical. She's a ethno musicologist, very much mixed up with Brazilian music, by the way, and also uh, music from Indonesia. And my son is an art historian, so uh, it's an anomaly in that family that they had this technical person. I cannot tell you what my grandparents thought. They never knew me. Yeah, I was a terrible student. Um, I mean, I had much, New York City is an education on its own. You live in New York City and that's, you don't really, if you have any interest in what's going on around you, you probably don't go to school. You get mixed up with other people who happen to be in professions or you go look what the city is doing. So yes, I was not a good student, but I did my work. No, I started uh, fixing electronics for people and building in 1940. Seven and 48, I started building hi-fi, high-fidelity equipment for people who had never heard any high-fidelity equipment. And that was a, I almost didn't go to college because I, they were so interested in, they, you know, get a good loudspeaker from a movie house uh, and uh, with good amplifiers that you could make in those days. Uh, you sounded like, uh, for classical people, people interested in classical music, it sounded like if you have a good speaker and a good FM tuner, and there's a good, that's, uh, there, is, there is music that is live music on the radio, not recorded music, you sound like you're right in the room with the people playing. And uh, so I had many, many, many orders from people who talked to each other and they wanted hi-fi equipment. The problem I had was I couldn't make phonograph records that good. Phonograph records, I don't know, that's an old thing. People seem to be getting very interested in that again, which is crazy. But they were made of shellac, and they were very rough. They had a rough surface, 
and they make they made noise, and especially in a quiet movement and not very fast movement, all you heard was the record noise. I don't know if you're you're probably not old enough to know that, but uh, the uh, and what happened is that I tried to make some electronics, which was past what I knew, to try to get rid of the noise, and everything I thought of made it worse. So I decided I better go to college to learn how to do that. The transition to the university studies was not easy because I was so somewhat undisciplined, okay? Uh, you can well imagine. But MIT was so disciplined that it became very disappointing. MIT was had very little room in the beginning for what I would call free thinking. If I made my, I asked to become an electrical engineer, an electrical engineer uh, was the closest to being somebody who could fix this problem that I thought I had, you know, with electronics and getting rid of the noise. And uh, it turned out that we, I, I tried in the beginning of electrical engineering at MIT, you learned about power generation, how transmission lines are made and how generators are made and how motors are made. And I said, no, no, no. I mean, I want to learn how to do electronics. No, no, no. That comes in the, in the senior year. No, you don't do that until we get to the senior year. So I got very distraught about that and eventually dropped out of electrical engineering and decided I would do my own talking to people and go into physics. Physics had less requirements. So that, that's my bad history to begin with. It got worse. It, it's, it was, I fell in love with a young lady who was a musician. And that went like all adolescent love affairs was completely one-sided on my side and uh, completely imaginary on my side, where the woman was quite realistic. So it was completely unbalanced, okay? But I got very desperate, and and I flunked out. And uh, then I got a job, which is as because I knew electronics, and this is the important transition that you're referring to. I got a job in a electronics laboratory, well, a physics laboratory, where since I could do electronics, I could tell the people, look, I can fix things for you, I can make things happen in electronics. And they were very eager, they hired me, and I became a union member, and I became a technician, an electronics technician for th three, three years. But I was very lucky that I happened to hit a laboratory where the man who ran the laboratory had some very interesting things that he was working on. <clears throat> One of them was atomic clocks, making a clocks out of atoms that keep very good time compared to the Earth, which keeps very lousy time because it doesn't keep a steady rotation rate. And uh, when he we got finished with making a clock that was good for good to probably a second every century, uh, he decided that he wanted to do something very important with new clocks and was to test Einstein's theory of general relativity. This, his name was Gerald Zacharias. He was, you can look him up. He's a very interesting man in physics in the United States. And so we decided to make a clock that was going to be a thousand times better than the ones we had made up to then. And the idea was to take atoms and throw them up into the air, like, like a ball, but they do it in vacuum. So you throw an atom up and eventually it falls down again, just like a ball. Now the atom that comes out of a typical source before it would turn around goes up about, oh, maybe two kilometers up into, into the sky. But uh, you couldn't make an apparatus that long. So you're dealing with this part of the velocity distribution of atoms that's very slow. There are slow atoms. And we were hoping to use these slow atoms to do something that would go maybe only uh, two or three meters and fall down. And it turned out that we never got any atoms that went that slowly. And I, we even made the apparatus longer and longer. We, we, kept, we worked on it for a lot of time. Never saw a slow atom. And the reason turned out to be that there were so many fast atoms that hit the slow ones and kicked them out of the beam. So there, we learned something, that my uh, whole relationship in physics is wrong. The, what's called the velocity distribution of atoms in a beam is wrong. And that was a big discovery, but, but we didn't publish it because we were so angry about it, okay? And so uh, anyway, that's, then he went off and started changing America's education in science. And I want to know why it didn't work. And I found out this, that the atoms, slow atoms get hurt, thrown out of the beam. And then I did a whole bunch of different experiments in his laboratory to try to make better clocks. And by that time, he got me back into graduate school. He got me into graduate school. I got a degree with him and went from there to, I became a, 
associate, an assistant professor at Tufts to, because I was many, many years too long a graduate student. And uh, that's the only way they wouldn't support a graduate student much longer than about five years. And it took eight years for me to get a degree, degree because I had so many different ideas I wanted to try. And I thought that was the best time of my life as being a graduate student. But anyway, I got done eventually and my wife got pregnant and so I had to really find a job. Look, my PhD thesis was a big bore. It was about the most boring thing I ever worked on. And uh, the reason is because I, my wife got pregnant. I had built all this apparatus to make a better clock and that was really hard to do. So I did a very easy experiment in one of the apparatuses I had built to make a better clock. I measured something totally uninteresting, only maybe to a chemist. This is the dipole moment of lithium, hydro, lithium fluoride. Nobody cares about that, except the chemist, maybe. And that was my thesis. I don't, I'm not very proud of my thesis. But it was done with techniques to make a better clock. And uh, so I got the job at Princeton, working for a guy named uh, uh, Bob De Robert Dickey, a very good guy, remarkable man, in fact. And uh, then uh, we tried to do an experiment to look at the Earth as a gravitational wave detector. That was an experiment he and I did. And uh, using something, something like a seismometer to measure the motion of the Earth. And, uh, but it turned out the kind of waves that could excite the Earth didn't exist. And those were called scalar waves, not Einstein waves. But he left an interesting idea in my head that maybe you could look for oscillating things in gravity. So I got a, a request to come back to MIT as a, a young professor from Princeton. And this was again, Zacharias who did this. And I started a whole group in two things, in gravitational wave research and also in cosmology. And the first thing we worked on was the cosmic background radiation. That's the radiation that makes up much of the universe and is a relic of the big explosion. Okay, so then I went to Princeton, came back, I told you that, and then started uh, working on both these two projects, namely looking at the cosmic background radiation and the gravitational waves. And as you say, very early on in my history as a professor, and this is an important story, United States, this is now the talk, this is about 19, uh, 1966, 1965, 66. I came back from Princeton in 1964. MIT, like most of the universities in the United States, had given up on teaching general relativity to anybody. In those days, it turned out general relativity had become part of mathematics, and it was not part of physics yet anymore. Why? Because there was nothing to do. There was no experiment you could think of that would be interesting. And physics doesn't progress if you only do theory. I mean, at least in my life, it can't progress. And uh, so what came of it is that uh, they asked me at MIT, because there had not been a general relativity course for 20 years, probably even 25 years, um, that I should give a general relativity course as a graduate course. Well, what I knew about general relativity was what you could put into it, the tiniest little speck of an insect. I knew very, very little of the mathematics. I knew a lot about the experiments, but very little about the mathematics. So I had but I couldn't say I didn't know it. Why? Because I mean, here I am running a group at MIT in cosmology and gravity. And if I don't know what the theory is, I mean, that would look pretty stupid and bad. So I was in a situation where I had oversold what I knew by accident. I had no intention of doing that. So I could not say no to giving that course. And so I started working very hard to try to understand general relativity, which is not easy for me. I'm not a very good mathematic, mathematical physicist, but I eventually got pictures for most of the things that made, made pictures for most of the things that were in the theory, like parallel transport and uh, what does the Ricci tensor look like and what do the various terms in the Einstein equations, what do they really look like? So I could sort of give a course. And, and, the, t and the students knew that I was in, not in my depth but they tried with me to help me understand. And we tried to, it was a very convivial thing in the end. Thank God the students were gentle, okay? They were nice. And so in the middle of the course, what happened is that uh, Joe, Joe Weber, who is quite famous at that time, and in 1960, he had invented a technique for measuring tensor gravitational waves using aluminum bars. And the idea was to look at the stretch of an aluminum bar and the compression of the aluminum bar 
as a gravitational wave went through it. And he invented that technique with John Wheeler together. John Wheeler was a very famous theorist at, at Princeton at the time. And uh, so Weber built some of these and to his misfortune, I mean, I really think his misfortune, uh, he began to see things. In other words, he built three of these detectors. He had one in the University of Maryland where he was a professor. He had another one in a golf course about 10 miles or eight miles away from the university. And then he had another one in the, in the city of Chicago, which was eight, uh, about a thousand kilometers, well, 800 miles, okay, away from, um, from where the university was. And to his misfortune, he saw coincident events, the idea that they were gravitational waves were, would be coincident. That was, he was expecting that. And he happened to see sort of two or three coincident events in every day. And he couldn't get rid of them. At least he says he couldn't get rid of them. He did all sorts of things, which many people, I don't know exactly all the things he did to try to figure out what it was. I don't think he tried hard enough to figure out what was wrong. I think I have a little suspicion that he immediately got on the idea that was a gravitational waves for sure. And it got him into trouble because what happened is in, uh, in 1969, I, he wrote a paper for the American, American Physical Review, the Physical Review, letters in fact, uh, saying that he had discovered gravitational waves. And that was very, very big news for everybody. And because the experiment isn't so hard, it was a fairly easy experiment. It was putting transducers on an aluminum bar. A lot of people were able to do that pretty quickly themselves. And to Weber's misfortune, uh, nobody, but nobody saw what he did. Everybody who had built the experiment, some of them had built it the same way as Weber. Others had built it a little differently, better than Weber. Uh, none of them saw gravitational waves the way Weber did. And this became a very controversial issue at physical society meetings. Um, and uh, let me tell you what happened in the course. So these students had gone to physical society meetings where Weber had given the reports, but not yet published, uh, that he had seen gravitational waves. He was seeing them for almost five years, he was saying he was seeing them. And now the students asked me to explain how that worked. How, what was going on with those experiments? I mean, how, does a, how do you detect gravitational waves with a, with a bar? And I have to tell you, I couldn't understand it. And that's where I made an invention, a pedagogic invention. I said, well, why not do the following? And this was over a weekend. I remember being very excited about it. I said, why don't you do the following? Take a, a mass, stick it out in outer space, take two masses, one stick one in outer space and then put them both near each other. And on one mass, the first one, let's call it the left mass, you put a laser and you put a laser on it and a switch to turn the laser on and off very fast and have that send its light to a mirror that's on the mass on the right. And then have that mirror send the light back to the laser. And when the light came back, to the, to the laser, turn off the laser and turn off the switch, find out how long it took. In other words, time the light going from the laser, from the ma mass on the left to the mass on the right, and then back again to the mass on the left. Take measure, very careful measure, how long it took for the light to go. And then if a gravitational wave came along that was perpendicular to the direction of the motion of the light, you know, the motion of the light is transverse to the motion of light, you should see a change in the time. Of course, no experiment can be made that that's accurate enough to do that, but as a Gedanken experiment, that's a perfectly good experiment. And so I did the arithmetic for them and they did it over again for themselves and they said, yes, you could make a detector for gravitational waves that measured the timing of free masses and the light between them. And you don't have to go to Ricci tensors, you just use the metric. That's all you have to do, learn how to use the metric and don't get messed up with having to measure, make measurements at different places. You make the measurements all in one place, all where the laser is. And those were two critical ideas, so I could do the arithmetic, okay? And that, yeah, everybody agreed that would be a good way to detect gravitation waves. And I also said it's impossible. No clock is good enough to do that. And that for any kind of gravitational wave you can think of. But anyway, so then Weber makes his announcement 
the course is long over, and suddenly it occurs to me that when they couldn't find, nobody could find anything. I said to myself, wow, maybe the Gedanken experiment could be converted into a real experiment. And it could, and that's what I spent one summer, about 1971 summer doing. I sat in a little room calculating all the things that would interfere with that experiment and found that if you built it on sufficiently large scale, you built it sort of on kilometer scales, and you did it not in the, only in one dimension, but you did it in two dimensions, call it the X and Y directions, and the, uh, and the gravitational wave is coming in the Z direction, okay? Then you would not have to have as good a clock because you would take differences in time between the two arms. So you had invented a Michelson interferometer for that. And that whole idea is in fact the basis of LIGO. Well, I mean, I've always been in, ever since I was in Zacharias's group, I got pulled into precision experiments. That's where that started, okay? Getting rid of noise, which is another part of it, was already started with the audio stuff that I had done earlier. And that became part of my life in general because every experiment I have been involved with has had noise you had to get rid of. And uh, that's the same thing as getting rid of noise when you listen to something and it's identical. So, uh, so working on atomic clocks ended when I left Zacharias's lab. I didn't work on that anymore. I worked with Dickey on that gra uh, gravimeter and gravity wave, scalar gravitational wave measurement. And at MIT, I began to work on the, the, the making a, I want to do a very different experiment, which was based on ideas of Robert Dickey. And that was my first big experiment at MIT failed. It was not a good experiment for a young professor to start. But I want to measure changes in big G, the G that's in the Newton equation. You know, F equals G times M1 times M2 divided by R squared. That G was thought that, and Bob Dickey thought that, and Dirac thought that, maybe G is a function of time. And they had the idea because maybe there's something in the universe that changed on scales of universal times. And they thought G would be the quantity that would do that. And so looking for a part in 10 to the 10 change in G was the big experiment. And I started thinking about a whole huge experiment to do this, making a gravimeter that was sensitive enough to do that. And I invented one. But then I figured, my God, the Earth changes shape. I have to also measure the shape of the Earth, not just the gravity. Because suppose the Earth changes shape, and that changes G. So you had to measure both the shape of the Earth and G together. And so I started making laser interferometers for measuring that, to measure the shape of the Earth. And it became a very, very big experiment. And the people said, well, you know, by the third year I was in this and had not published a paper, people at MIT said, you know, if you don't publish something, uh, you're going to get thrown out. And I said, no, no, this is very important. We got to get this right. But I, eventually one guy got to me. And so he says, look, why don't you do something a little simpler? Uh, and, and to do this later. So I said, well, the other thing that interests me is the temperature of the universe, which had just been discovered. And, uh, and I, so we decided, okay, we did something I thought was simpler. We tried to measure whether the, back, whether the radiation that came from the universe, the three degree radiation, actually behaved a black body formula, a Planck formula. Now, that was only possible if you measured up into the millimeter waves. And so we had to invent a lot of technology to do that. We had to do it from balloons. And, and again, it took two or three years. And again, we didn't publish much. We published something about astronomy. And they had a big meeting. And I guess they almost threw me out of MIT. Okay, But luckily, they didn't. Or at least for me, it was lucky they didn't throw it. And I think the guy who almost threw me out was Steve Weinberg. He was at that time at MIT. And he said, this guy's worthless. He can't get anything finished. So uh, anyway, uh, and so what happened is that uh, we eventually did make a measurement of that showed it was a black body. And then we did it, and we also discovered a terrible problem. We discovered that the galaxy was full of dust. And that became a big pain in, because now everything you want to measure about the cosmic background radiation, you had to separate the dust from the cosmic background. And that was terrible, but that was very important for COBE, that satellite. And, my contribution to Kobe was that, that we had to have channels that would measure the dust. And the man who actually is responsible for Kobe is John Mather. And uh, so uh, anyway, uh, when we got done with that, I started working at, I went back to gravitational waves and started thinking maybe we should start building 
well, we had started, I know, I, that's a little out of order. At about the same time as we would, I was secretly working on a gravitational, small gravitational wave detector. I didn't want to give that up. And that was being done in parallel with the ba cosmic background measurements, but with no people on it. I could not put the people on it because it was not an accepted project. So it didn't get done very quickly. But once we got done with most of the measurements, the balloon measurements, I went back to that. And, uh, and that's when LIGO actually began. Because what happened is that's when I ran into Kip Thorne. But when it became as I, I wanted to do, it was quite clear to me after I had did that study uh, that the 1.5 1, 1. meter prototype that we had built at MIT was never going to do any science. And that was the big problem for MIT. MIT was upset with the idea that there was an experiment that would do no science and did a lot of technology. In those days, that was not something except for high energy physicists. So when I came up with the idea that I'd like to build something on the scale of tens of kilometers, I, the first thought was, we get the one and a half meter running, which it did. I want the next build a 10 kilometer system. We, we, and the, there was a very good group in Germany that had taken up the idea also to build interferometric detectors. They had gotten the idea from, my, from, from my, what I'd written, but they were very much better organized and they had money and they could make very fast progress. And that German group, in, which was in Munich, did the best work of anybody in that field for many, many years. And they gave me the confidence that I could now go with the, with the results of their experiment and with what I, my one, one and a half meter, and with the fact that now there is maybe a field there, I was able to push for a 10 kilometer system. And I went and got some money from the NSF for that. They gave me money to study that. But MIT was not friendly to this. They thought the thing was just going to big, be a big boondoggle. And so the only way I could make progress with that, after we got a study done, we got, I got Caltech, uh, Caltech and, and, and MIT together made a proposal to the NSF to build LIGO, okay? And it was very crucial because there was no skepticism at Caltech about the field. Caltech, because of KIPP, believed that there would be gravitational wave sources. People at MIT didn't believe in black holes, for example. They thought black holes were a fiction. And they knew about neutron stars, but they they didn't think neutron stars would come in pairs. So that they and they thought supernova would never make gravitational waves either. So they just thought it was a bad thing. Don't go near it. And so I had to deal with at that time. MIT completely changed its mind ten years later. But that at that time there was a particular group of people who thought this was a bad thing to do. So I joined up with Caltech, and then that became a very powerful co collaboration. And the fact that we went forward was mostly due to the fact that Caltech had faith in this. And so they then became the people who ran the project, and they're the ones who got the money from the NSF to run the project, and they gave us at MIT a subcontract. So, and that's still the case. The program, LIGO program, is effectively run by Caltech. It's their, pro it's their, it's their program. And they put, the, they, they did the engineering, they brought everything. But then what happened, MIT played a big role. I mean, I had a group that was very good. People, excellent people, they're still in it. And they, but we worked together and it was not, that it was not competitive. It was a joint collaboration that worked very well for many years and has still worked. So there was a little trouble in the beginning with MIT, but that in the, in the end, MIT came around. When, they, when you change administrations at MIT, it turns out it changes the character of the place. And that, once it looked like it was a going concern and a place that had the reputation like Caltech was doing it also, MIT was willing to go along with it. And now they're very proud of it. It took a long time. So the collaboration was a very good thing. And, but it was mostly because it was done collaboratively with Caltech. And that is that, uh, well, you have to now look at something. We now know a couple of facts because of the discoveries we've made. We have now measured 30, 40 black hole pairs. Uh, very, one very elegant thing with a binary neutron star, you know all about. And there have been a few others in the data, but nothing is, not as, nothing is close to us as that first one. And it's very clear that we didn't make the detector the right length. We should have made the detector 10 times longer. It turns out it's four kilometers. And the reason it's four kilometers is at the time, none of us, well, it, was, it costs money. It's the most expensive part of the gravitation wave detector is making that long vacuum system. And the, 
So what was done is was done, how we came up with four kilometers was really mostly a compromise between not going so expensive that the NSF could not afford it anymore, but not to make it too short so it wouldn't detect anything. So it was, but it was a bad compromise. We did not know that at the time because we didn't know what the sources were up to. Now, if you make it four, uh, 10 times larger, a 40 kilometer system, and we're looking very hard at that, that's the right length to make it. Because then what happens is you take the whole field and the sensitivity of that system is strongly dependent on the length because you're measuring a strain. And you already have all sorts of wonderful ideas that have been incorporated in the four kilometer system, which are, if you use those in a 40 kilometer system, you can take the whole field and bring it into cosmology. For example, you could see every black hole binary that exists in the universe. You can see all the neutron star binaries that exist. If you now take the population models that we believe in, because we have now enough measurements to know that. And now the other thing is that it can take you into some fascinating regions. For example, it can take you it, it won't take you to all the way to the, what I would call the inflationary cosmic gravitational wave background. Unfortunately, that is extremely small. There is an idea for how to do that, but I, let's, I'll talk about that at the very end. But right now, that is not possible with LIGO. It's not possible with the space antenna, which is being planned also, which is called LISA, which is the thing that was an American project, became a European project, and now is actively being pursued in Europe. And that will fly, we hope, sometime in the 2030s. Now, that will see much longer period gravitational waves, but again, will not see the primordial gravitational wave background predicted by inflation. The only thing that does that right now or has a chance for it is the B-mode experiments in the South Pole and in, in, the, in, the, in, the Chile, in the Chilean Atacama Desert. There are experiments there to try to use the polarization of the cosmic background as a way of determining the cosmological background of gravitational waves and the energy of the inflaton. Let's leave that go. That gets very detailed. On the other hand, for the ground-based work, if you build a 40-kilometer system, you will find out, do we have primordial black holes? For example, a region of the cosmology we do not understand at all is what's called the dark period, the period right after the decoupling of the black ground radiation to the making of the first stars. Let's call it a Z of 1,000 to Z of 30. That we know nothing about. We don't even know how to make the first stars. And that's exactly where a 40-kilometer system would tell you a tremendous about new things that are really wonderful. And on top of that, I think it will tell us a great deal about Einstein's theory, where it works and where it doesn't. I mean, especially if you have much heavier black holes uh, than we have. That This will come also from Lisa. But the, I think the interesting thing has becomes the near-term cosmology. And there are other things you may be able to see that are cosmological. Namely, if there are phase transitions in the early universe, not the very early one, not the one that made the initial gravitational wave background. But for example, all the forces, the forces were once equal in, 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 in strength. When, the, when gravity broke, broke off from the other forces, you might see that transition as a transition that isn't not completely uniform in the universe. That makes gravitational waves that we could see. Or more likely, if you go to a little bit later in the history of the usual universe when the weak interactions broke away from the electromagnetic interaction, that if, it, if that is a close associated with a complete some anisotropy, that made gravitational waves also. Those could be seen by a 40 kilometer system. And, uh, and so it turns out that it's, I think it's the it's it's it, it, it's the exactly the right thing to do. It finally is the size, and we hope to be able to sell that project to the NSF and the Department of Energy in the United States, and we hope to have three of those detectors. We hope the Europe, Europeans are thinking also of something equivalent to this called the Einstein Telescope, so there be money in Europe that is going to come into this, and hopefully in Australia. Maybe by that time, the people in Australia who were very interested and now themselves have made a lot of progress in interesting their government in having a south, south southern, uniform, southern hemisphere so, uh, detector, they might build a third one. Anyway, that's a plan for, again, the mid-2030s. Well, look, let me be honest with you. I, I love the doing experiments, okay? 
but I don't want to waste my life on things that nobody gives a damn about. And so I know there are some problems that really are interesting, and I'd love to work on those. And and they're, they're generally hard experiments, and they're people, you don't get publications very quickly, and a young person nowadays can't do what I did. They would get lost. I, what happened to me is sort of a miracle that I survived all of that. But nowadays, it's even worse. And I wish it wasn't that way. I wish that, uh, you know, things were, uh, there should always be some risky stuff done by some fraction of the physicists. And I, all my life, I keep telling people, you support good science. I tell this to the NSF, I tell this to the DOE, but leave a little bit, maybe 10% of what it is to some crazy things, things that are, could make a, a completely different view of the world. And those are the things that the people who are really interested in the experiment and doing things new should work on. So I, it's, it's, a, it's a conviction, okay? Well, let me tell you something. Here I'm very conservative. I happen to think uh, that every time Einstein has been tested, and I mean that, he's come out on top. I mean, I have not yet found a time when he derived something, even though he didn't believe in it. He, he didn't believe in black holes. He didn't believe in gravitational waves either. But he calculated it, and I have not yet seen a thing where he's been wrong. So I will bet on Einstein every time. I will not bet on uh, new theories of gravity. I will not bet on uh, that there's something crazy happening on very small distances. I think it's going to be just Einstein all the way. And I hate to tell you that. It's very conservative, but I, I'm in love with that man. <laughs> the message for students is two things. No, I have a message for students. And I'll tell you what it is. Have fun with what you work on. Okay, if it isn't fun, you will never finish it. And it turns out I'm an experimenter because I enjoy doing experiment and I enjoy working with people on experiment. It isn't because it can win a Nobel Prize. That was never in my mind. But what, what it was, it, it, one day's work leads to the next and, and the, the problems come from trying to make the things better and better. And that's what drives it. And when you solve something, it's an enormous pleasure. You go out and have a beer with everybody. It's a, you know, it's just a joy. So that's what you want to look for in science. Have fun with it. Don't worry about where you wind up. And I don't know anything better to tell any student. I get very depressed when I read the newspaper. And I, I mean, here we are. Science has created a lot of things that we do and accept. For example, this vaccine. You pick a very difficult thing. We have employees on LIGO who don't, want to take vaccines. So we had to let them go because the, the, we cannot keep people who are unvaccinated. So I've had many, many horrible conversations with very good people. And I find that it's, it comes, I think we're worse off now than we were, let's say, 10 years ago. And it's because of the wire of the net, God damn it. The net is, uh, is an unrestricted source of dishonest information. Uh, and it turns out that causes more more problems. I mean, it's almost what like Goebbels, what Goebbels did during Hitler's time. He would make lies. We have people lying. I mean, forget about science. Look at that. We've got an idiot president we had, and now he's destroying the democracy of the United States. He's an evil, evil man. And people say he's a hero. How that happens it, it, all within the last 10 years is, I think, completely due to things like people being able to put messages on without any kind of reservation and lies all over the wire, over, all over the net. It's the worst thing that's happened to us, but it's also a wonderful thing to have. You can see how this piece of technology has caused, I think has caused the United States to go into a horrible direction. And that's also where the skepticism comes from. I'm sorry to say, uh, and, and uh, I don't know how we fix it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's terrible. So I don't have an optimistic thing. And I, I would almost give up the wireless just to stop this crap. But that's, I don't think so easy to do anymore. I am optimistic. I mean, I'm just pointing out the problems. I wouldn't be, I'm still alive, right? I'm 89. I'm very eager to do the next thing. Okay. That's optimism. I, okay.